All right. <clears throat> Since we're talking about the urinary system, we need to talk about diuretics. And we do use diuretics in renal disease, but mostly in oliguric renal failure. Uh, instead, we use diuretics really for a lot of other diseases. All right, anywhere we have fluid accumulation, edema, cardiovascular disease that is associated with fluid retention, uh, and some others that I'll talk about, we use diuretics for those effects rather than the renal activity. There are five major classes of diuretics. And here's a diagram of the nephron and where they work. Okay, you need to know this because when we combine diuretics, we want them working at a different location typically. Okay, and those are at the glomerulus. You've got the osmotic diuretics like mannitol being filtered into it and then observed exerting their osmotic activity to hold fluid there in the tubule. We've got carbonic anhydrase inhibitors working on the proximal renal tubule. Loop diuretics, understandably, working at the thick limb of the ascending loop of Henle. Thiazide diuretics working in the distal convoluted tubule. And potassium sparing diuretics working on the collecting duct and to some degree the distal convoluted tubule. Okay. <clears throat> and examples are all given there. So let's talk about those. The osmotic diuretics, uh, mannitol is your prototype, but it's not the only thing that's going to cause an osmotic diuresis. If you give 50% dextrose IV to a cow with ketosis, you will get an osmotic diuresis. Uh, hypertonic saline may cause it, although not predictably, not enough that we use it as an osmotic diuretic. Same thing with intravenous DMSO. Uh, you'll get a pretty good uh, diuresis following IV DMSO extra label use. But mannitol is our main osmotic diuretic. It's an inert sugar given IV. Okay. Now, the inert is important. Uh, actually, when they've studied hypertonic dextrose, there are some deleterious effects from those metabolically from those high dextrose concentrations that I won't go into. So we want this inert sugar. Uh, you'll find a lot of, a lot of uh, clinicians or hospitals keep their mannitol in a crock pot or incubator. Uh, it's very prone to crystallize out even at room temperature, so that's why they keep it at higher concentrations sometimes, or higher temperatures. They really need to fix this microphone. Okay. Uh, as I said, it's filtered at the glomerulus and osmotically draws or retains fluid. As I said, <coughs> we use it in oliguric renal failure. I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, it's one of our mainstays in trying to manage that. Non-renally, its primary use is in cerebral edema, acute cerebral edema. We'll do other things to manage it longer term, but when you got that traumatic injury uh, to the brain and the brain is swelling, and because the brain is in an enclosed cavity, brain swelling, it can't expand anywhere, so the pressures go sky high, and you wind up with brain injury. And uh, in worst case scenarios, uh, you wind up with um, cere cerebellar herniation and death. So we give IV mannitol, uh, it stays in the blood and draws fluid from the tissues, in this case from the brain, to shrink that swelling. It's also used in acute glaucoma. Uh, <coughs> a lot of the moderate glaucomas we will uh, use other agents we'll talk about, but in an acute glaucoma, when you see pressures up in the 50 and 60 millimeters of mercury, you only have an hour or two uh, to try to save that site. So you want to rapidly lower uh, the intraocular pressure, and mannitol does that exact same thing. It draws fluid out of the aqueous humor, out of the eye, to rapidly lower the uh, intraocular pressure. And probably those uh, two, especially the cerebral edema, is, is one of the ones we'll use most commonly. 
I'll talk about uh, hypertonic saline as an alternative in cerebral. Okay. All right. So, uh, contraindications. Uh, active CNS hemorrhage when we're talking about cerebral edema. In, in, uh, we don't want to give mannitol to reduce cerebral edema if there's hemorrhage into the brain. And that's because the mannitol is in the blood, and so when it bleeds into the brain, it's in the hematoma within the brain itself. And mannitol is, uh, doesn't diffuse out into the tissues very well, <coughs> so uh, it starts to draw fluid to the hematoma. So you wind up worsening the cerebral pressure because this fluid is flocking to the hematoma and swelling and swelling and swelling. So we don't use it in, uh, when we think uh, uh, cerebral bleeding is occurring. Ideally, in what they do in human medicine, they're gonna run a quick CT on that person and make sure they don't have uh, bleeding before they'll give mannitol. We can do that in vet med. We're lucky to have a CT scanner where we can. A lot of people, it's kind of a roll of the dice. Uh, depends a little bit, obviously, the longer you go after a trauma, the more likely the clot has finished clotting. That's kind of redundant. Okay, uh, so it's not actively bleeding. Um, <clears throat> so that's a contraindication. It draws all this fluid from the interstitial into the vascular system. So you don't want to use it in congestive heart failure or pulmonary edema for that reason. It will worsen the volume in the vascular system and make it more prone to volume overload. And I said we use it in oliguric renal failure, but we only use it if it's working. We give a single dose. If that's not enough, we might repeat it. All right, and hopefully you get the urine flowing by then. If you don't, you do not continue to give it because you will cause a hyperosmolarity and all the deleterious things that go along with that, okay? So that's osmotic diuretics. Um, any suggestions? <laughs> Um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, uh, relatively mild diuretic, they work in the proximal renal tubule. And normally, you remember, carbonic anhydrase uh, converts CO2 and water into carbonic acid that then uh, disassociates into bicarbonate and the hydrogen ion. Okay, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are going to block this conversion. So you don't have hydrogen to interact with the sodium hydrogen pump. So hydrogen ion is decreased in the urine. That means you have more retained sodium bi or bicarbonate ion, and the sodium is retained in the urine. So you get a retention of uh, sodium and bicarbonate in the urine, so you have an alkaline diuresis, all right? It's a relatively modest and transient diuresis. It does promote loss of potassium by the kidney. Uh, one of your learning objectives is which ones promote potassium loss uh, versus retention. But because it's a mild diuretic and tends to be transient, we don't really use it as a diuretic. This is just a convenient place to tell you about it because our uses are scattered all over the place. All right, so this is an underlying mechanism to talk about it. Uh, in human medicine, it's used for metabolic alkalosis uh, because of that excretion of bicarbonate um, by the kidney. <clears throat> but in veterinary medicine, we don't have very much metabolic alkalosis that we have to deal with. The primary time we see a metabolic alkalosis in veterinary medicine is from uh, severe vomiting or uh, stomach problems like abomasal problems in cattle. So our primary goal there is to um, 
<coughs> uh, correct the underlying disease and we only address the metabolic alkalosis if it's unusually severe. And remember, uh, as I mentioned earlier, saline diuresis is our first approach to metabolic alkalosis. Uh, <coughs> by uh, providing that extra chloride ion, we uh, enhance the uh, removal of the bicarbonate. Again, in human medicine, they use it in hydrocephalus. Uh, <coughs> there is an active carbonic anhydrase activity in the brain uh, involved in CSF production. So you decrease CSF production by that same mechanism. Now again, rarely used in vet med. Uh, instead, we use omeprazole, which you know is an acid suppressor, proton pump inhibitor, but it does decrease CSF formation somewhat. <coughs> and glucocorticoids also decrease CSF formation. All right, so what do we use it in? Uh, we use it in equine hyperkalemic periodic uh, paralysis. This is where they get the sudden uh, high potassium concentrations. It's actually a sodium channel transport deficit, but it's the high potassium that triggers it. And because I mentioned that these promote potassium excretion, we can lower our potassium in these horses. So acetazolamide uh, is primarily um, uh, used in uh, equine HPP, uh, where it is one of the more common agents. Now, acetazolamide could be used in glaucoma. Just like it decreases CSF production, it decreases aqueous humor production. Uh, it has largely been replaced, though, by the topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And these are the ones that Dr. Bet Bees mentioned to you. Trusopt and Azopt, Azopt being the more common one now, decreases aqueous humor production. Now, the one disadvantage of these topicals is that they are uh, rather expensive. Uh, so if you're trying to do something on the cheap to decrease aqueous humor production, acetazolamide would be very cheap for you to use but they tend to feel bad on it. It, this, uh, it produces this male, mild metabolic acidosis and they don't feel all that well when they're taking it. So mainly we use the topicals for glaucoma. So carbonic anhydrase inhibitors work as a uh, transient diuretic, but we use them mainly for other purposes.